Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar by Infogistics. The title is called Smart UX Design for Smartphones. I'm Tobias Komischke, and I'm the Director of User Experience here at Infogistics Services. I studied that UX stuff. Um, I have 12 plus years professional experience in research, development, and all kinds of consulting in the realm of uh, UX design. And this little image here is the first one I've ever seen uh, about, back then we called it usability engineering. And uh, it's the situation where this guy ends up on a strange planet and uh, finds himself faced with an alien life form that asks him, well, which keys did you press? And that's exactly, I think, the situation that we as UX designers want to avoid. So we don't want to make sure that users who engage with a technical system at any time know what they have done, that they know where they are, and they know what they can do next. At Infogistics Services, we do um, consulting and training surrounding the topic of user interface design and development. So we do user experience design, interaction design, visual design. We do front-end development and implementation, everything that comes to mind when it's about the front-end. We do this cross-industry. We do this cross-platform. And because we have, obviously, uh, heavy engagements and interactions with customers, we hear a lot about questions that are asked. And a lot of those questions revolve around design and development for smartphones, and in general, small form factor devices. So today, I just want to share some uh, knowledge and experiences that we gained, and hopefully, you know, you can profit from that and uh, apply that knowledge as well. But before we start, the question is always, when we say UX design, what do we mean by user experience to begin with? Because there's many different um, definitions of it. I personally like this one here a lot, which says that UX is the envisioned, expected, or actual experience of a user interacting with a technical product. So it's not only the actual experience, it's also the envisioned and the expected experience, which really talks about design time when you actually design and try to anticipate how a user would engage and how a user would feel using a system. And obviously, what we try to accomplish is what you see on the bottom left uh, image of these um, people having a really good time interacting with a technical system. That's what we try to accomplish. This is what we envision. And so hopefully, the actual experience will match that envisioned experience. As a matter of fact, no matter if you care about UX design or if you invest in it or if you have resources that deal with that topic, there will always be a user experience. And that's just important to note because that experience may be a very good one, hopefully, but it could also be a very bad um, user experience in case that, you know, nobody cared about it and you just, like, um, develop something without having the end user in mind. And so on the bottom right side, you see a developer who um, codes a front end for a whole um, interactive system. And so for those people that are involved with the design and development, we do these kind of webinars. And this webinar should be interesting also for people that may not be that interested in smartphones. Why? Because we'll talk a lot about um, UX design principles that are universal. It doesn't really matter if you uh, design for a smartphone or for a desktop application, they are universal UX design principles. I will also talk a little bit about um, the Windows uh, design language Metro, which will be uh, also featured on Windows 8. It comes up in uh, October, and uh, it's really interesting uh, to talk about and uh, to discuss. But obviously, smartphone development, uh, a lot of People do this, you know, as a private sports and actually make really good money on it. This screen here is a screen of an app that's called the $1,000 app. And it was done by someone who came up with this idea of here's an app, and the app is all you see here on that screenshot. It doesn't do anything else. 
it shows you a screen. On the screen, there's kind of a jewel, and you have a like a, a lighting red background, and that's all the app is doing. But that person who built that app sold it for $999. And when we talk about the ambition and actual user experience, there are people that actually like that approach and actually were very happy to spend $999 on this app that doesn't do anything because they could show it off and say, hey, you know, I have this cool app and I paid $999 for it. But a lot of people, and you see this here on the right-hand side of the screen, were not very happy with it. They had a very bad uh, user experience once they understood what they did, which is, you know, they thought it was a joke and then they just yeah, uh, downloaded this and bought this from the App Store. And then they realized they just spent $999 on something that doesn't do anything. And they were, like, really, really mad about it, which you can see by the all caps text here. And I think, meanwhile, uh, it's not available anymore on the App Store. At least uh, I couldn't find it anymore. So what is a smartphone compared to regular PCs or devices? So here on the left side, you see the world of the PC. So... PCs are universal. You can run any kind of application on it, several applications at the same time. You have an operating system that runs on your machine, and then the UI runs on that operating uh, system. So things are more or less uh, standardized. And uh, the UI of the application um, can be... Uh, completely unique. So even though you have a standardization in terms of like the basic uh, OS standard, what the actual application is doing may be quite unique. And everybody would agree, yes, it's a, it's a PC. The desktop PC is a PC, the notebook is a PC, even the tablet, people perceive that as a PC, PC and assume you can do things that you could do with a regular PC as well. Now, on the right-hand side, you see the world of devices. Devices are typically specialized, so normally only one application is running on them. You see this here for the camera or for a navigation system in your car. The UI there is oftentimes very unique to that device, maybe just proprietary, just was built for that one device. So everybody would then say, well, this is not a PC, but this is a camera or this is not a PC, but it's a GPS. Now, where does the smartphone fall in here? Well, it falls right in the middle. So the form factor is that of a device, while what's happening on the device, the UI look and feel, is of a PC, even though it is shown on a much smaller real estate. And so the question is, whoa, what does that mean for the UX? Because now you have something that lives right in between would people assume it behaves like a PC, or would people assume it's like more the device? Well, you as designers and developers, you can shape what people would expect from this. And depending on what you do, whether you do native app development and design, or you do web apps, um, it may mean different things. If you do native app design and development, you more or less are uh, living within the constraint of the design language of that OS. And you see here the four most prominent ones from left to right, Android, BlackBerry, iOS, and Windows Phone. And you also realize even though principally, of course, they do similar things, but they are different in their typefaces, the iconography that they are using, the gestures that they allow to uh, execute uh, the colors that they use, navigation, the layout of the content, and interaction patterns. So looking at the um, screen real estate and what it means for the user um, uh, phone interaction, well, you don't have the luxury of uh, having tons of real estate, right? It's a very confined real estate. And that typically means that you talk about very flat structures. So you have, if you want to build a task flow, spread that flow onto more screens than you would do on a PC. So for example, here on a PC application where you have a start screen, 
that start screen may have access points to different subscreens that then allow you to do things. You may even have uh, certain UI elements of certain tasks already on that start screen, and you typically have some ancillary information. And now, for example, I could maybe click here on the access point to, this, to the screen A, and would then end up on screen A, which would then uh, feature UI elements for a certain task, and then access points to other screens, yada, yada, yada. This is typically what you have on a PC application. There you have the real estate. On a device, though, you don't have that real estate, so you have to spread these things across several screens. So your start screen may just have enough real estate to show you access points to other screens and nothing else. And then when you go to a screen A, you may just do step one out of that uh, task flow. And then on the next screen, you would do step two, etc. And so that's the difference. Uh, the difference between a PC application and a device. I'll show you examples in a second. But it basically means that you need to reduce the Chrome and focus on the content. Uh, icons in that respect can be very helpful because you can convey a lot of things with an icon and save a lot of real estate because you don't have to use uh, as much verbiage. In terms of navigation models, you see here um, two basic approach, approaches. The top one is that uh, one that Windows Phone uses, and they call it hub and spoke, with the basic idea that you start from a certain screen, and then you can go into subscreens, and it can be more steps than just this one step that I show here, for example, from A to B. You could also go then from B to B1, B2, B2, B3, etc. But when you're at the end of one of those um, uh, flows, you would then go up to the start screen, to your hub, and then go down the spokes again. So you'll not typically have a link between here, one spoke to the other, for example, from B to C, but you always go back to your hub. It comes from the airline industry. They basically operate in that kind of mode. And that means that if you have N screens, the number of links you will have is n minus 1. So I have four screens here. I need three um, navigation paths between those, three connections. Another approach that is used by iPhone and Android is the point-to-point -point navigation, which means that I not only connect um, a superior screen with the next level, but I also connect every screen with any other screen. So you see here, Different to the hub and spoke, the B screen is connected to the C screen, the C with the D, and the B with the D, which means now I need six connections for my four screens, and the formula is n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Now, both of these principal navigation models are basically extremes. Um, it's, there are a lot of uh, WinPhones apps that actually have a pure hub and spoke implementation, so it actually looks exactly like this, but there's other applications where you actually can do shortcuts from one screen to the other without going back to the main hub. And the same was true for the point-to-point. -point. It's really an extreme case that you would connect every single screen with any single other screen, like this one here. It's really an edge case, and I'm not even familiar with any um, app that would do that kind of things, so that you would really connect every single screen to every single other screen. It's an extreme case, and so is the pure hub and spoke. The reality out there would always live somewhere in between those extremes. So I did mention uh, icons before. Icons can help to declutter your screen when you don't have enough uh, room, especially for smartphones, obviously. And uh, there are characteristics of good icons, and there are three that uh, are really good to memorize and uh, you know to keep in the back of your head. One is concreteness, and concreteness means the degree of the pictorial resemblance of the icon to the real world counterpart. So the more the better, the more concrete the better. So for example, here it's an icon that uh, says attachment. 
And you see here in terms of concreteness, it shows a page like a real page would look like. It shows uh, this paper clip like the real paper clip would look like. So it's very concrete, and by that it's very understandable for a user. The next characteristic is complexity, the richness of details that are depicted on the icon or by the icon. So you see here a camera, and it's pretty detailed. I mean, you see here the uh, the mechanism of the flash that you know comes out here. You see the the knobs and dials for the program, and then the um, the, the button to actually take the photo. You see here the the lens. It's very detailed. The problem is that level of um, complexity uh, doesn't help you when you shrink down that icon. And you can see this here very well here. If you look at the small icons of the same camera, so the, the very smallest one here, for example, you don't even see all these details here because you can hardly see the icon to begin with. So there, the complexity doesn't really help you. And so here the recommendation is the less, the better. And you may rather think about what does a camera prototypically look like. And it's not really important whether or not a camera has a flash or not, or if it has one or two of those dials. The prototypical camera is more like characterized like it's you know a rectangular shape and then a round shape on it, which is the lens. This may be more helpful than to understand the icon than the richness here of the details. And the third one is called semantic distance. It just means how close is the icon as a visual and the represented function that it's trying to depict. So for example, if you have an icon that shows a printer and the function of the icon is actually to save a file, that's a huge semantic distance because the image and the function have nothing to do uh, with each other whatsoever. Now for abstract um, icons or symbols, like you see it here, this cancel um, icon or uh, remove icon sometimes, that is a problem um, only if the meaning is not already established in your, so to say, icon vocabulary. Obviously there is a semantic distance because what does this cross has to do with um, cancel or removing something. Not too much, but it's an established icon that we have seen before and that we know what it's doing. So in that respect, um, uh, we know what it's there for. So in general, semantic distance, less is more. And so I don't assume that too many of you would ever create their own icons. Typically you have specialists, visual designers who would create icons or you buy icons from icon data sets, uh, but if you do so and you know you get new icons, here is a way to like uh, rate them and just apply those three characteristics to see if those icons are good or not. Good or not in terms of the understandability and the learnability for end users. Looking now at our four main uh, mobile OS uh, design languages, here are typical icons, and you see that, in my opinion, BlackBerry sticks out a little bit in that the icons are a little bit more complex than the icons from the other languages. And one reason is that um, they are a little bit more complex. They show more detail, more granularity than the others. And another reason is they use more colors. So you see here a green check mark, and you see here uh, a yellowish um, log, while you see here the other sets, they are all monochromatic. These are gray, these are, you know, steel bluish. Here on the on the far right, uh, the uh, Windows um, phone icons, they are black. But in general, they try to be, you know, as simplistic as they can be. I personally like the Windows phone icons uh, and the Android icons very much. So even more pronounced on a small form factor, it's really important to at any point provide this orientation. This is obviously the same image I showed at the very beginning. And so at any point in time, it's a very generic UX rule. It pertains to all kind of uh, form factors. 
but obviously, especially for the small ones, you have to be able at any point in time to provide good answers to the three questions, where am I, where have I come from, which means what did I do, and then what's next. And how can we do this on small form factors? Well, first of all, we want to really separate what's signal and what's noise. What is important and what's just Chrome and infrastructure and, you know, things that you need to have, but they're not that important. And here the heuristic is show as much necessary and as little as possible. And, you know, here at the bottom you see a screenshot um, of a page that has a pretty big and large and comprehensive breadcrumb path. So at one time I started at the home page and I drilled myself down into deeper and deeper sub-hierarchies. Uh, and then I ended up at this page here that's called Security Solutions. And this is what you see here, the content for it. Now, breadcrumb paths are really nice and powerful because they not only tell you where you are, but also where you came from. And I can now click on home directly and go with one click all the way up. But I could click everywhere else in between. I could click on here, uh, business solutions, and I would see that page. That's really good and powerful. The problem is you need a lot of real estate that you just do not have on a small uh, uh, smartphone. So what we see rather on a smartphone is a very abbreviated and truncated uh, breadcrumb path. So here for the iPhone, for example, it's just one step, which means here I can click on back and go um, back to my superior level. Sometimes it's just called back. Sometimes they actually say what it means. So here going back means I go back to settings. Now, if you were to do a web app where you don't have to comply to those um, um, OS uh, web, um, OS design guidelines, maybe you have enough room to show two of those uh, menu levels. Maybe you see the current ones, settings, which would be the name of your current screen, and you would see the superior one, in this case here, in the example on the right, it would say main menu. But it's pretty much all you can do. You don't have more real estate. So again, looking at all four um, OS design languages, uh, on the left, Android, you actually have two uh, options. You can click on the back button on the top left of the screen, which you know uh, brings you back hierarchically, but within the application that you are currently in. Or you can click at the bottom um, hardware key um, and go to the previous screen, and it actually goes across apps. On BlackBerry, um, the back navigation is done through context menus. So you have a context menu that comes up from the bottom left, and you have a context menu that comes from you know different access points within your screen, and there you have um, ways to move back. On iOS, uh, we just showed this on the other screen, you have the back button, which is the software button located on the top left. And I'll talk a little bit later about the positioning of those relevant buttons and you know what are good positions and bad positions in terms of um, touch and blocking your screen. And on the right, uh, we see Windows Phone. Here, the back um, button is a hardware button. On the left button of your screen, it also goes across apps. Now, obviously, uh, mobile devices and smartphones are used anywhere. That's why it's called, you know, mobile platforms. So people take this outside. It's different from your typical office environment where you're more stationary sitting in front of your setup um, system. Um, and one thing that comes to mind in terms of environmental factors that may um, impact the design is the noise, for example. So noise masks the auditory signals do not rely on uh, auditory signals alone, because if you look at this photo here at the bottom, this is a Penn State, uh, a Penn Station, New York City, very crowded place, obviously, during rush hours. Don't rely on um, people be able to hear anything that you want them to hear on your smartphone. So you may want to double code um, any kind of uh, uh, communication that you want to have by not only uh, solving them in auditory means, but also uh, visually. 
Then we have glaring effects, glare from sunlight or glare from strong lighting that you have. That swallows a lot of your contrasts that you can see here on the top left uh, image here. And what that means is that you may want to overpronounce a little bit the contrast, even though it looks, it may look a little bit, you know, too much contrast in your office environment when you design things. But when you take it outside as a user, you will be thankful for it because glare swallows contrast. And then forced one-hand use. A lot of people, when they use an interact uh, with their, their smartphone, only use it in one hand to begin with. So they, they hold it like here on the top left um, in the hand and then use the, the thumb to engage with it. But there's also situations where you don't have the choice because you have the other hand to do something um, equally important, for example, steering your car in this uh, center image here or holding on to something when you are in the subway. So in that respect, you don't even have the choice. You have to use only one hand to engage with your um, smartphone. And then you can, for example, not assume that people would do, you know, crazy fancy uh, multi-touch gestures that involve two hands. It's just not possible. I'll talk about that also in a, in a bit. Um, the more mundane UX uh, considerations here revolving around text and color, both legibility and readability heavily depend on text size and color contrast. Color contrast, I already mentioned, text size, since you tend to hold the device closer to your eye than you would usually see, for example, a PC in your office environment, um, you want to make sure that at least you want to have an uppercase character height of 1.4 millimeters if you measure that on your device. 1.4 millimeters for an uppercase character height um, would be the minimum. Everything that's larger than that is a good thing. Uh, smaller screens do impact the text comprehension because typically there's more scrolling involved. You know, you have to scroll up and down to see, for example, section titles and uh, um, items that you may have read before. But then again, a smartphone is not the best device to begin with to show lengthy text. People do prefer larger displays, and you can tell by the evolution of the uh, car navigation systems. If you look at the standalone devices of uh, TomTom or Garmin, they tend to be uh, growing and growing, even though it would be perfectly fine to show this on a very small device because in the end it's just about your street that you are on in the next turn. But people just enjoy seeing a little bit more, and it's why a larger display, you know, it's a good thing. Um, and from what we hear, the next iPhone, iPhone 5, um, is supposed to be a, a larger than the iPhone 4 for the same reason. At the bottom right, I just uh, put in a screenshot of a color contrast analyzer tool. If you just Google for contrast analyzer, you will find tons and tons of links of tools that allow you to um, analyze foreground and background colors and then the contrast that's created by that and uh, with some metrics that just allow you to understand better um, different contrasts to make sure that you have a high enough contrast. Um, it's also good, now that we talked about, you know, reading things, the flip side of that is entering data. Um, what you do want to do is, uh, is avoid um, that people have to put in too much data too much, what, whatever this is, a street name or whatever, because um, putting data into a smartphone is kind of cumbersome. Um, the current smartphones, they all have a virtual keyboard, but it's still obviously because of the small real estate and the virtual nature of the, uh, the keyboard, more effortsome than to use you know, a full-size physical keyboard that you may have in your office. And we we know what patterns there are, right? The type ahead pattern where I, here in the top left, I started to um, uh, put in broad way and just put in broad W, and it gives me an auto completion and say, well, you know, here are at least three targets that all start with broad W, which is Broadway, New York, Broadway, Queens, and Broadway, Brooklyn. And then I can just click on that and don't have to type in the rest of it. Below that, um, the typical car navigation 
auto-completion here, which is more on a single character basis. So based on what I typed in before, the system shows me what um, characters are available now to add to my string. Obviously, if you can avoid to type anything in, that's pretty cool, like here in the middle, where uh, in one application I have some information, maybe about a restaurant, and I have an address here. And if I can just copy that address and paste it into my TomTom GPS app, that's awesome because I don't have to type anything in it. It's faster. I don't make any errors here. Um, that's a really good pattern. And now in the age of Siri, I can also use voice input to tell the system what I want, even pretty sophisticated stuff like, I need to hide a body, and then Siri is uh, clever enough to ask me really good questions, which is, you know, well, what place are you looking for? And here are some alternatives. So that's another way to avoid having users typing something in. So I said it's not, you know, the nicest thing to type something in for the reason that um, you have small real estate, but you have to show a virtual keyboard. The drawbacks of touchscreens. Um, are good to keep in mind because obviously you do not have tactile feedback, which means that it's easier to make input mistakes. And every study out there that I'm familiar with and that compared the entry of text uh, on a physical keyboard, even if it's a very small one on a phone, and a virtual keyboard, the physical keyboard always wins. It's just more efficient in terms, in time, in terms of uh, data entry. And so what you can do, short of actually providing a, a real physical keyboard, is at least provide auditory feedback on the uh, virtual um, uh, tab or a vibrate feedback, just that you have a better um, feedback on the, I just tapped on something, and yes, it took my input. Another reason why touchscreens um, sometimes are um, – a little bit critical is that you do need your visual attention to make use of it. If you have a physical keyboard, and you know the car manufacturers use that for the infotainment systems, you can blindly you know feel where the different controls are, and you know you, you see something round, and you know it's a turn dial, and you can use that. On a virtual, or on a on a touch screen with virtual controls, you you cannot feel anything. You actually have to see it. You may know and memorize some positioning cues so that, for example, here in the middle, the one is you know, towards the center of the screen and it's on the left, but there's only too much you can memorize there. And then probably the most important one is that if you use your hand and fingers, you tend to obscure your touch targets or other elements on your screen. So you see this here in all three examples, even in the middle one where you have a lefty engaging with the system. By just tapping on a target, you block other elements that you are on your screen. And it talks a little bit about, well, what are good locations to put relevant um, buttons on? And it not only for smartphones, but for any kind of touch system. Also talking about Windows 8, and they do a really good job on in, uh, putting uh, uh, look, uh, elements on good locations. So good locations are at the bottom of your screen or on your phone, and at the left, because most of the times people will use the right hand, and then if you engage with something only on the right edge of the screen, you can still see anything on the left. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second too. But generally, for a smartphone, you can say the bottom is the safest, and then it's the right edge corner. In terms of the target sizes, one of the epic UX design rules is that by just increasing target sizes, you just did a lot to improve the overall usability of a system. If it's the only thing you do, just do that. Just make sure that target sizes are big enough. If it's click target sizes, you know, for the mouse, but also for the finger, make it large enough. And there's not the one single guideline or recommendation out there in terms of, you know, how many millimeters or inches that minimum size is, but they all pretty much are similar to those that I list here on that screen, which basically means uh, for squared buttons, it's typically around 9 or 10 millimeters um, 
for um, the side of that square, and you want to have um, at least two millimeters between them just to avoid that you hit the wrong one. Um, if you want to go more like rectangular here and uh, actually shrink a little bit the height of it, then uh, you obviously want to make the width a bit larger. So um, 7 by 20 is another um, popular recommendation out there. Now, if you think about the size, the actual physical size of an index finger or your thumb, the average here that it took from, from some uh, anthropometric um, and database says that the average index finger, the diameter of the, of the index finger here is 18 millimeters, and for the thumb, it's actually 25 millimeters, which if you compare it here to this 9 millimeters here, it's far larger than that. So how come, you know, it's only 9 millimeters if your index finger alone is 18 millimeters, knowing that most people use the thumb? Well, obviously people never use the flat index finger or the flat thumb. You always use the tip. And for the tip of both of these fingers, 9 millimeters is safe. But what you also do want to um, um, have is an increased touch target size. So even though your button may be just 9 by 9 millimeters, you want to have a sensitive area around that. So even if you don't hit the button directly, uh, the button would still take the input, which is one of the reasons why you want to have sufficient spacing between elements. So like here, the 2 millimeters at the top. Now, talking about gestures, obviously, you know, smartphones um, have gesture libraries built in, um, and they're mostly the same. I will show this in the next slide. But just reflecting on, well, what can I do with gestures, and what gestures do people know, which gestures are easier to know and learn, and which ones are harder. So this is um, a list here that Luke Roblevsky um, was introducing, and I think we know a lot of them. Uh, some of them we don't. We all know the tab. I just briefly touched the surface. We know the double tab. We know the drag. We know the flick, which is basically um, a quick drag. We know the pinch and spread, which we use for zooming in and out of elements. We know the press. Oftentimes we call that the press um, and hold, because it's not just a, a tab. It's a, a tab that you know where you keep the finger on the surface until you see a feedback. And I think those are standard ones that I think most of us are familiar with. But then it gets a little bit more sophisticated. You see here, um, press with one finger and tap with the other finger. That's a little bit more specific. And then on the last row, you see here even two-handed gestures, like press and drag and rotating something using two hands in different ways. So that's a little bit more specific. And in my mind, uh, I think what's really safe gestures are those in green, and anything in red um, is out there, but maybe not on every phone, and maybe only for very specific context or very, very specific app environments. So it's, I think it's good to reflect upon, well, what are gestures that I can use, that I can assume people already know, and which ones are a little bit more sophisticated that I may only want to use for very specific instances. So here are the gestures that are supported um, natively by the um, different iOS um, platforms. And you see that most cover all the bases. So you know, tap, tap, and hold, double tap, drag, swipe, pinch, all of these are supported for all four of them. Um, only iOS and uh, Windows Phone support the flick, according to, to this here. And iOS is actually the only one that supports the shake. Even though I'm not sure if I remember any kind of app other than games that you would have a shake um, function in there. I think in games I've seen it where uh, I don't know, you, you have some, some bag of content of something and you want to empty that bag and then you just shake your phone and the bag is emptied. That's what I remembered, but I'm not sure how prominent that shake is, but I just thought it's interesting. And iOS is the only one that... Um, has that as a uh, standard gesture in there. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, Windows Phone and the Metro design language. Um, as I said, Metro will also be the UI language on the Windows 8 OS, which is upcoming uh, for October. 
So it was already introduced uh, a while ago for Windows Phone, and now they also will extend that to Windows 8. So here at the bottom left, you see a screenshot of um, one of the um, Windows 8 previews where you see it's kind of the same treatment that you see here on the top right for the Windows Phone. But what is it all about? I think Microsoft did a really good job because what they did was they really followed the advice that a lot of UX people um, had given uh, for years, which is for small form factors, reduce it to the max, only show what's really important and forget about all the rest. And I think that's what they really accomplished. So I really like that for the smartphone. Metro is based, it's called Metro because um, it's based on um, uh, metropolitan uh, and airport um, thick signage. You see here on the, in the bottom right here, um, something that really looks like, you know, what that we see actually here on the software, where something is simple, it's really clean, straightforward, there's no pseudo 3D or drop shadows or anything like this. It's really reduced and without any frills. And Microsoft called this the fierce reduction, like really uh, maximizing um, the content and forgetting and leaving out everything else. Content comes first, content is king. Metro comes, you know, with its own font, Segoe, WP. They have 10 accent colors, two background themes. One is uh, light, one is dark. And looking at the um, controls, the basic controls, like push buttons and checkboxes, etc., this is what they look like. Not necessarily only in this color, obviously, but look at the states. Very, very reduced. Here on the push button, the rest state and the, the, the finger down state, again, no pseudo 3D, no drop shadow, everything is flat and really reduced to the extent that sometimes I think it's a little bit borderline. Or would you have known on the bottom left here that what you see here is not a progress bar, but it's a slider. So it's an interactive uh, UI element that you would take your finger on and then, you know, set another value. It's a slider. But First of all, it does not necessarily look like one because, you know, there's not even a, you know, a touch um, a target uh, um, that would be uh, sticking out. Uh, you would not necessarily know where to click here or where to tap, rather. And also, it's pretty small. It's not very thick, so it's kind of challenging to hit this. So here, the fierce reduction is, I think, at its border. Uh, this one here on the right to it is a toggle button where without knowing the label here, if you did not see the label, which obviously you do, it may also be a little bit tricky to tell, well, is which state here is the on and which one is the off. Basically, you rely on the color information here heavily to see, well, this seems to be on. Um, and now, putting this together, the issue about the back button, the issue about the location, and the issue about you know tapping and gestures, and yes, I know that uh, most people would not use this uh, gesture here, just the, the index finger to engage with the phone. They would probably hold it in the hand and use the thumb. But I just want to make the point here that you see iPhone or iOS users engaging with their device, and you always see that they tap, they remove the whole hand, and then they tap again. Why? Because this major button, major in terms of important, or you know, it's really frequent to use that button, of going back, is positioned on the top left, which means that any time you will tap on that, if you're already, you will obscure most of the screen. And that's really why I like the way uh, Windows Phone is laid out, because all the relevant hardware buttons are at the bottom. So if I click on the back or the Windows button or the search button, whatever I do, I do not obscure my screen. And that's really nice. And this is on the hardware side of the phone, but it's also um, taken forward to the software side. So now, on top of my hardware button, I have the so-called app bar. And the app bar shows you the most important functions uh, that you need for the screen that you're looking at. And so again, you don't obscure things because you work here from the bottom. You can click here on these three buttons, the little uh, three dots here, and you would also see labels that explain to you what the icons are. And you can drag this further up. 
if you run out of real estate and need more than these um, four functions here, you can have them here in the list. Um, if you then rotate your phone from portrait to landscape, you can you know, le left or right landscape it, and then your buttons would uh, go to the right or the left. So depending if you're a righty or the lefty, you would left or right landscape it. So that I really like. Um, this one here are just two different um, um, main ways that uh, Microsoft allows to access complex screens on a small uh, form factor. The panorama view is basically the idea of showing a big canvas, but you look at this canvas basically through a lens. So you can move uh, by, by just um, swiping to different areas of the canvas and see different um, parts of that. And the pivot is uh, similar, but it's not a consecutive um, uh, canvas, but it's more like a tab structure that you can also um, access through um, swiping. So now, um, for the last couple of minutes, I just want to show you two examples of um, native uh, WinPhones apps that we built and the process and the challenges involved with them. This one here is uh, Jeff, uh, one of our uh, visual designers, and he did, did the uh, visual design for both of these apps. So, you know, what you see here, the visuals are um, the work of his visual design. And both of these apps were showcase apps, so those are apps that are, you know, actively advertised by Microsoft. And so because of that, they really wanted to have the apps very, very true to the Metro style guide. And so we had to go through different reviews. One was a design review, so we gave them vision screens of all the different uh, screens for the apps and also screen flow diagrams that showed the overview of the navigation. And then Microsoft reviewed this for their UX criteria and for compliance to Metro design guidelines. And then the next certification, uh, the next review was about the certification. Here we gave them the, the actual code in the Zap file and they tested against uh, you know, pre-formulated test criteria. And only when both of these um, quality gates were passed, um, we could add it to the Microsoft Marketplace. The first project example is MealSnap. MealSnap is a nice app by a company called Daily Burn, and it allows you to keep track of your calorie intake. The idea is you can make a photo of what you eat or drink, and then the app would not only uh, you know, log that and archive that, but also will find out on its own how many calories that snack or that drink had. And so in the end, you can then review on a daily basis or over days or weeks how much did I uh, took in, how many calories, what was it, what did I took in for breakfast or lunch or snack or dinner. Uh, this is the overview. This is the screen flow diagram. And then we had challenges because we did this for Windows Phone, and Daily Burn already had an iPhone version out there that was very successful, which is the reason why they wanted to put this also now on uh, Windows Phone. They wanted to expand their reach. And this is what, you know, the start screen, the first experience uh, uh, was looking like. So here no uh, calories have been noted yet, no photos have been taken. So you see that screen with a little um, instruction on what to do. And basically this big button here um, was meant for them, for users to make a photo, and that is the start of, you know, the flow. Now we took this, and when we did this, uh, the translation to Windows Phone, we took, for example, here um, the settings uh, access was on the top on the iPhone and put it down here on the app bar. But we kept the uh, uh, took take picture of, uh, button on the bottom left, at the same position, same size, same icon, and same color because um, this is obviously the icon of the app and it's the brand colors of Daily Burn. So we didn't want to lose that. It's really the signature um, button here, and it provides a really good affordance for users to just, hey, hit me, hit me, because it's the start of my flow. But obviously, in the Windows Phone world, if you want to be really true to Metro, this guy has to go in the app bar, and uh, we had to do that, otherwise we couldn't have passed the quality gate. So now, we moved that big and very prominent button and moved it in the app bar, 
And now, from a visual hierarchy perspective, it, it looks the very same way as our settings button, which is not really what is the intention because it is much more important. It's the signature and most important button on that screen here. But to be true to Metro, we had to put it down here. So that talks a little bit about walking the fine line between being true to the original design intent that Daily Burn wanted to put out there and being true to Microsoft's uh, Metro design guideline. And sometimes, you know, it's hard to, like, please um, both of them. I'll skip one, this one and go to this one, which was another example where we said, okay, whoa, now we have to think about how we do this because in on the iPhone you could, once you had an entry, so here I took a photo of a snack and now it came back and said automatically, hey, you know, we identified this as an element Joy candy bar. It has between 179 and 268 calories. If I swipe on this entry here, I can now share it with the social um, uh networks out there, or I can just delete that entry. Now, in the Microsoft world, you don't want to do this with a swipe, but somehow else. And so we decided to use the tap and hold patterns. So now you tap and hold here, and then you see we see kind of like a, uh, a light box with a little indicator that this functions here pertain to that uh, row here. So again, we just had to translate from one design language to another. Or well, this one here, the settings page, you see the difference. This one here obviously is more reduced. It's not as cluttered as the iPhone one, but the iPhone one, because of some of the clutter, which is here, the, for example, the, the framing around groups of, uh, of functions, make it a little bit clearer on that they belong together. So it's very clear to see I have two things under general and three under sharing, which here, because things are more open, it's a little bit harder to see. Okay, the second project example that we did was we built the official 9-11 Memorial Guide app for the 9-11 Memorial in Manhattan. So if you will visit the site where the trade centers, uh, where trade centers stood, um, we have an app that you can uh, download for free on the uh, Microsoft Office uh, uh, smartphone platform that allow you to find the names of loved ones or, uh, you know, people that you know that um, were victims in that um, attacks and that are shown here on these bronze panels that surround these waterfalls that um, mark the imprints of the, the, the towers. Because there's almost uh, 3,000 of um, victim names, it's very hard to find them if you don't know where they are. This app here allows you to find them. And, you know, we went through the same process. You know, we first did wireframing, then we did vision screens, and then, uh, you know, we designed every single screen, um, trying to stay, again, true to um, the Microsoft Metro standard. So, for example, here you see the functions on the screen that shows you a virtualized version of, the, uh, of that bronze panel with the highlight of the, uh, the, the name that you were looking for. Or um, here on the left side is the um, a list of all the victims here by um, alphabetical order, and then there's you know a couple of more features in there like uh, uh, information on the victims or um, some oral histories on on victims. Here's the uh, application flow diagram that shows you how uh, different screens are connected, and here's an, a photo of the first day that the memorial was opened, which was September 11, 2011, 10 years after the attacks. And um, you see here those bronze uh, panels, and you see how large this is. This is just one of the two waterfalls that you know, mark the imprints of the, um, uh, the two towers that um, were destroyed. And you can imagine how hard it would be to find a name uh, without any guidance, and this app provides you that guidance. And for us, the, ch the challenge was here really that normally if you talk about smartphone apps, you talk about fun, joy, colors, and all these kind of things. And th this was none of it. This was really, like, very reduced because it's a very serious topic, sort of, you know, trying to convey this, you know, respect for the victims and trying to be even the same 
subtleness of the colors here because you see that the bronze is not, you know, a lot of colors in there. And so we really try to convey this here also on the app. So this one here, it's, it's everything but colorful or fun or, you know, portraying some, some happiness. It's, it's, it's very different from that. And in that, it was really um, a challenge. Um, here again, photos of the first day where um, a lot of people already uh, downloaded and used and installed um, our app. And the feedback was uh, very, very good. It was all um, four or five star ratings um, for that. Uh, so we were very happy that the people were happy. Were happy. So with that, uh, let me come to the executive summary. It's good to keep in mind that smartphones are just PCs in a form factor of a device. So it's good to try to understand what regular day users, not super experts, not developers, not hero designers, but just the regular users of smartphone apps, how they look at the phone as a device, what would they expect it to be able to do, and what they would maybe not know what it can do. Generally, the more reduced the UI, the better the UX. So this fears reduction is a good thing. Try to think about what is really essential and what can I leave off. Show as much as necessary and as little as possible. Obviously, if you over-reduce things and, you know, don't show anything or only show a, a red jewel and want $999 for it, that's not the goal either. But decluttering the screen is super important, especially for the smartphone form factor. Other than that, typically all the usability ground rules apply in terms of contrast, in terms of colors, in terms of text size. All this is not different from any other system. And when designing native apps, it's good to, you know, obviously to comply with the platform standards because what you get for free is that people, users already know how to engage with your app. But if you design for web apps where you have more freedom, you know, it's good to like hold the, uh, the user by their hands and provide good affordances, good feedback that people know how to engage with um, their device. So that's the end. I hope you had an enjoyable one hour and that the information here were, you know, not only hopefully entertaining, but also that you could learn something that would help you in the design of smartphone um, UIs native apps and uh, web apps. Thank you very much for joining, and uh, this um, recording will be shared with you so you can review it at a later time. Thank you very much, and goodbye.